It is fair to say that the sport of extreme triathlon has been on quite a journey of late. Having started out as a very niche and particular offshoot of the sport of triathlon, reserved really for just the committed few. With its humble origins over a decade ago at the now famous Norseman event in Norway, to well now becoming a really sought after event that athletes from around the globe want to be a part of. Yeah, and now that the dust has settled on both Fraser and I attempting our first extreme triathlon back in the summer, we thought we'd have a little debrief of sorts, get stuck into the nitty gritty of these events and how it went for us, why we got involved, and give you some tips actually. Yeah. And maybe if you are interested in doing your own extreme triathlon, maybe just learn from our mistakes. This has been really tough for me to train for. It's been really hard for me and my girlfriend. Um, yeah, I'd be mad if I wasn't scared of this event. To say I'm proud is really an understatement. What he's achieved throughout his whole career is it's quite an achievement. You're right, he won't take this because he'll worry too much about warming yeah, up again. Trying to put that on, he won't. Right, Mark, I did Keltman, you did Norseman, but in all seriousness, why did we choose these races? Well, I can only speak on my behalf here, but <laughs> for the yeah. t-shirt, obviously. <laughs> Barely taken it off since. Obviously, yes. you've got a t-shirt as well. Can smell that that's been on there for a little. No, no, yeah. I mean, I did do um, my race a few months before Mark did, so I wore mine out a little bit too quickly. Yeah, it did smell a bit. Uh, but I started the same colour with this video here. So I got my blue one, and Mark's got his black one. Yeah, um, but in all seriousness, um, Norseman's just been on my radar for years. It's one of these events that's just, it's grown, as we've sort of mm. said already. Um, I love Norway. The scenery's incredible. But obviously, the fact that it has been dubbed one of the toughest triathlons or one of the toughest events in the world. I was just drawn to that, that kind of masochist mindset in, mm. in me. Just, I want to kind of experience or push my body to the limit and see what I'm capable of. And I don't know, like that, that was pretty much it for me. I wanted to see whether I could do this thing. And you love the idea that having not done a full distance Ironman, that would be a pretty corker of an event to do as your first one. Kind of cool to come back in the office and uh, when people say, oh, so have you done an Ironman? I'm like, no, but I have done Norseman. Yeah, so which yeah. <laughs> is kind of up there at the pinnacle of events. I mean, for me, Kettleman was um, a race that, I'll be honest, didn't actually appeal to me too much when I was racing full time for the main reason being that it seemed blooming tough, like more than blooming tough, extremely tough. I knew quite a few people who had done the race a number of times and everything about it just seemed awfully difficult. But once I moved away from racing, you know, professionally and regular Ironman, I suppose you'd call it, very quickly realised, you know what, there's actually only one big race in Scotland that I never managed to do and that was it. And I think you touched on something really good there actually because I think we all get caught up in times and paces so much, particularly when we were racing professionally. Whereas this race, it's, it's not really about times or pace. It's about this race with yourself or this kind of like, this challenge in yourself. And a lot of it is mindset. And it's just trying to get through this epic day out and just trying to get to the end. So the times almost become irrelevant, unless you're obviously competing at the front of the race. But it is, um, it, it's kind of quite nice actually to take a step away from that pointy end of racing. I, I couldn't agree more. That being said, I would be lying. I still didn't scan through the results from previous years, see how fast were they doing it? What was a rough winning time? <laughs> Just to get a handle of how long I was going to be out there, I might add. All right, well, that sort of moves us on to the next question. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, did we feel prepared? Did you feel prepared for anything? <sighs> No, not not for the gravity of the race that I was having to go and do. I knew exactly how tough the race was. I know we keep saying that because that's what these are. They are very tough races. Um, you know, I had done my best to feel equipped for the swim and the bike distances, the run in particular, marathon distance, of course, because it's a full Ironman, but it was over mountainous terrain and I, I'm just not used to climbing mountains. The Keltman in particular has two summit um, passes that you go over during the course of the marathon and I'm just not used to doing that sort of running or really not done an awful lot of hill climbing if I'm perfectly honest. So that worried me and I just didn't feel very prepared for that. Yeah, and I don't think it really matters how much racing we've done over the years or professional events or whatever. Nothing really prepared us for this event or our events, Keltman and Norseman. They are so totally different. We had 
definitely out of our depth. Yeah, I mean, everything about the race, neither of us had attempted to do before. We'd had no dry runs. Neither of us had wrecked any of the courses beforehand, which would have been something that we would really ideally have liked to have done. You know, for, for in both cases, I mean, Norway and the north of Scotland for us, where we are right now, working was just too far away, unfortunately, to get to at the weekends, for example, to maybe have a look at and get familiar with the course, which an awful lot of people had done, certainly in, in Keltman. And I was aware of that when I got to the race. People would be asking me, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And I would sheepishly have to go, mm, not so sure. Yeah, um, 100%, I couldn't agree more. In Norse, when you could tell people just knew the mm. course inside out, definitely uh, most people that were racing around me had done the race numerous times before and got that experience. That said, the events are really good at trying to get that information across to you if you are someone like us turning up on the day more or less and just racing. like. I did more or less know where I was going and what to expect and photos of certain junctions and I could see the gradients everywhere. So it wasn't like we were going into the complete unknown, but having that little bit of experience might have been... Yeah, no, absolutely. I suppose we should clarify that we had done our absolute best from afar and I had spoken to everybody that I could and I was aware of what was going to be coming throughout the course of the race. But there's nothing better than having actually had a look at something beforehand because you still feel like it's a little bit blind and um, for both of us that was part of the excitement I guess. Yeah, which you know, another thing that maybe we weren't fully prepared for was actually the support mm. um, which is a really big factor for these extreme triathlon events or X-Tri series events because you don't have aid stations out there, mm -hmm. you are kind of fending for yourself along with your support team. So the idea is as an athlete you have a support team so as soon as you come out that swim the support team are in the car and they follow you. They essentially leapfrog you throughout the race, meaning that you can stop or grab stuff on the go and they're essentially your mobile aid station. And that takes a lot of planning. Yeah. And like, you're worrying enough about the race itself, let alone mm. then trying to pass all this information on and making sure that boxes and bags are ready with the correct nutrition and clothing should you need it. Your, your, your support team needs to know all of this and know, needs to know where to stop appropriate places, climbs rather than descents, etc. It's, it's, it's all about having some systems in place and that obviously is a lot easier if you've got practice and if you've done it before and again neither of us had done this before. I was lucky that at least some of my support team had been to Calman before, had raced over the race, Sean my support runner, he had done it so that helped me a lot so I was quite lucky in that regard but we still had kind of a, a bit of a you know let's hope it all works lucky as we go type attitude in my support car. We had a vague system that we chatted about in the preceding days, but the first time that we were all actually together in one place was the day before the race, which was for, for us a little bit hectic because there's a ton of other stuff that needs to get done the day before. And then likewise, when we were in Norway, we still had to kind of firm those things up really close to you getting in the water, really. Well, yeah, I mean, I literally the night before the race, I was just mm. popping stuff in like, Bike, they were basically like bike helmet bags, weren't they? I was just like checking bits in and like, for, you know, it was quite late at night, so Fraser didn't see this before the race, and I was literally like in the morning at 3 a.m. Fraser, here we go. Yeah. This is that, this is that, this is that. Um, fingers crossed, let's, let's make this happen. And let's hope that everything stays fairly organized in the car, which if you have watched Norseman video, you might have noticed we got a little bit disorganized. You did a fantastic car. job. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's something to be mindful of if you are gonna do an extreme triathlon event. Yeah, you, you simply have to have full um, trust, I guess, in the um, support car that you've got looking after you the whole way through the race because you really are reliant upon them and you look forward to seeing them as you say at those leapfrog points. It's when am I going to see them next? And you have a little bit, certainly I was having a little bit of dialogue and saying, right guys, you know, when will I see you next or how far will it be? Or if I hadn't had that, I would just be, you know, um, hopeful that it would never be too far down the road that I'd see them. And I brought that into our support car, I feel, for Norseman because I, I, I hope that me knowing that in my race would be useful for Mark. So I always tried to say to Cassie, let's not be too far away from Mark when we stop again. Yeah, and that was, um, I mean, the support team is invaluable. It's, mm. it's literally impossible without the support team. Um, but now let's talk about the race itself. So yeah. how was Keltman for you? Yeah, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. These races are extreme, they're supposed to be extreme, and that should make you feel nervous beforehand, whether you've done the race before or not, like we hadn't. So first and foremost, the swim. I was genuinely worried about the cold water that is up there in the northwest of Scotland because I know it's cold, it, it does not get particularly warmer at any time of the year in those waters. Um, 
and I don't do a lot of swimming in cold water. I don't like it, wouldn't choose to do it. So I hadn't been in practicing beforehand. That was a choice of mine. I just decided that no, I'd made my um, commitment to the type of equipment I'd use, as thick a wetsuit as I could get a hold of, some extra neoprene that I'd wear under that. We'll come back to that later. Some booties that I'd wear on my feet and an extra skull cap for my head. So that was my precaution for hopefully getting through the swim in as well, as, as, as comfortable a manner as possible. Um, and I know you were the same when we got to Norway, you were worried, but we actually had a little bit of a surprise. Well, yeah, in Norway, actually, you had a heat wave. So <laughs> yeah. um, I'm the same as Fraser, it never really coped well in the cold. Mm. Um, that said, we've always raced in the cold as if it was a professional race. So we were wearing basically <laughs> just our tri suit, normal wetsuit, maybe a skull cap at most. We weren't actually racing with potential like base layers underneath or thicker skull caps or booties that would help to keep us warm because it was a real fast mm. race. Um, whereas for the Norsemen obviously and the Keltman, we could go in there a little bit better prepared. This is a long day out. Let's just make sure we get through this and we survive the cold. So we were prepared for the, that potential. Yes. Um, we had these neoprene base layers we got from Orca, um, the, the, what's it called? The heat seeker um, base layer, which is fantastic. We had the skull caps, booties all prepared, but we had a heat wave in Norway. Um, so actually it was extreme in almost the other sense. It was so hot. The water was still quite cold, but the, during the day it was really hot, but it did mean that I didn't need this base layer. I didn't need a skull cap. I did wear a thermal wetsuit just to be safe, but I probably still didn't need that. Um, but yeah, that, that was obviously a big worry for me too. Yeah, these, these are just, um you know, par for the course worries that you have in extreme distance racing is being able to cope with these elements. And I was really glad that I got through that swim without it sort of implicating further on my race. Although the heat seeker neoprene vest that Mark talked a lot about there, I might have forgotten to take mine off when I started my bike ride, which maybe explained why I was feeling so desperately hot in the first portion of my bike ride. Um, if you maybe watched our video, you'll notice that I had to stop in a panic to get my support team to help me pull it off because pulling a neoprene vest off is a rather difficult thing to do when you're tired and hot and grumpy. Um, but it certainly did a job and kept me warm. Um, so we had a little bit of a chuckle about that. Yeah, that was quite funny. Um, On to the bike then. Um, how did you find it? Yeah, um, I loved it actually. For the most part, I, um, I, I felt like I had done a reasonable amount of long bike rides. Um, Norseman is extremely hilly, Keltman is just a little bit hilly but actually quite long. It's over 200 kilometres long just because there's so few roads in Scotland to make the loop work they just had to have a 200 plus kilometre ride. So I was a little bit anxious about that because I haven't ridden that far, you know, very longer than an Ironman, a traditional Ironman, so it was a little bit into the unknown for me. Um, but I really enjoyed the first portion of the bike. We were lucky we had a tailwind, so that sort of got me going. Well, we were actually kind of in a similar situation because you led the swim out. Yes. I led the swim out in, Nor in Norseman. So actually we were kind of, we we're both being chased for the first portion of the race, which I haven't thought about before. So actually we yeah, had a good in, a, in, a similar, in a similar situation. I think you've got a little bit more experience over this kind of distance. So you maybe had a bit more confidence, whereas I was definitely kind of trying to keep a cap on it um, at, in the early stages, because I literally was, I was already in the unknown after the swim, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and let's, not, let's not shy away from the fact that Phil Keltman had a really good, you know, small field of, of men that I was, you know, really, um, um, mindful of and respectful of racing against. You were doing the X Tribe World Championships. There was a whole slew of excellent athletes chasing down yeah. after you on the yeah. bike, so you really had to be careful. They were fast, yeah, and it was quite <laughs> hard not getting carried away. I did go with them for like five to ten minutes at one point. I was like, what am I, what am I doing here, Mark? Yeah. You just let them go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you hung on to that for quite a long time, that lead. Um, it was only in the latter stages uh, uh, that you got past, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And, and, and to be honest, I really started to struggle towards the end of my bike ride. The last hour of the ride really was tough going for me. And I'm sure the same as you, all I wanted to do was just get off the bike because quite honest, six hours of riding is just a long time. And I was looking forward to the marathon, although worried about it because like I talked about earlier, I knew how tough that marathon was and I did feel underprepared. Yeah, well, I was actually weirdly where I was so cautious on the bike, mm. actually feeling quite strong towards the end. I had a lot of issues with cramping early on in the race during the swim and the bike. And actually that kind of held me back in, in a way. It very uncomfortable meant that I couldn't get down the aero bars and well, comfortably into the aero bars. So actually on the last climb, although it was tough, very hot, I actually felt really good and I was I, I, I couldn't believe it I was like 150k into the race and I'm like 
<laughs> good to go. I can actually push on, but maybe I should hold back because I've still got a marathon to go. Yeah, and that was interesting because in the Norseman, we as a support team, we weren't allowed to see Mark for that final 30K, so about 150K mark. On that final climb, we were able to give him his last bit of nutrition that we could give him and just make sure that he was okay and just reassure him that, right, cool, we need to drive on there and we'll see you at T2 and wait for you there to get you on for the marathon. And I think that was... Um, that was probably, I would say, difficult part for you because obviously you were coping with it, but it's still that notion that actually, right, that's me just gonna have to settle in and just look after myself yeah. now. I have to say, I mean, obviously I was into the unknown. A lot of new experiences in this race. Had my first pee on the bike. <laughs> Very proud of that. Yeah, um, yeah. he uh, told us that as yeah, well. Yeah, twice actually. <laughs> um, learned some tips, uh, phrases, said, you know, use a bit of water after. Very yeah, good tip. Go yeah. clean. Yeah. Um, also, actually, just like so tired being in the aero bars after 180k, I was actually on the descent, so I was like, actually, just like putting my chin onto the elbow cup <laughs> um, so I could rest my neck. And I was going at like 90k an hour with my chin on the elbow cup. I wouldn't recommend that, no. but I was just like, my head was so tired. Um, but yeah, it was an awesome experience. Then getting into the transition, knowing you've got a marathon to come. It's a little bit daunting, I've got to say. Yeah, and then that again, coming back to your support team is where you, um, you look forward to seeing them because there's been a little bit of a time. The same for me, I, I hadn't seen my support team for a little while towards the end of the bike. So you look forward to that, it perks you back up again, re-motivates you to start tackling the next leg of the race, which is this marathon. And in both cases, we were you know, worried about it because you'd never done a marathon in a race and I hadn't ever done a mountainous marathon. So it was really good to have support team there but also that they were calm and they weren't getting you worried or anything. And I think in both cases, well, certainly Cassie and I tried to, we were making sure you were, Cassie made sure you were covered in sunscreen. Um, with my guys, they were just making sure that I was just, you know, calm and collected and yeah, just making sure that you are focused. On now, um, I know having trained with you in the lead up to Keltman, running prep, haven't been ideal, right? So um, you've had a little bit of a niggle with your hip, but you did remarkably well considering that you had had this hip niggle going into it. At what point during the run did things start to go a little bit south? Pretty quickly, unfortunately, Mark. Um, in advance, I knew that the marathon had um, two sections, essentially, an easier first section, or, or so I felt, leading into the second, more mountainous half of the marathon. I woefully underestimated how hard that first easy section of the marathon was. It was over some really open exposed moorland, really difficult terrain actually. You were, it was runnable but slow going and, and, and basically my morale got low, I was struggling, I wasn't feeling great, low in energy, all the things you don't want to happen. And as I got through to the second portion of the marathon, you had to stop and do a mandatory kit check um, before you went up the mountain. And at that T2A, as it was called, point in the Keltman, I was really quite low and genuinely, concerned about a whether I could keep going and b whether I should attempt to go up a mountain in this state which I suppose most people in the race are going through at different times this just happened to be my low point and similarly watching you in Norseman round about the midpoint of the marathon a, 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 an equally difficult low point yeah definitely um yeah I, I was so for Norseman it actually starts off pretty much yes. pancake flat you follow the road uh, around the lake on yeah, a well-paved tarmac road. So it's actually quite easy underfoot, very different from what you had underfoot. Yes. Pancake flat, and then the second half, you essentially start the mountain climb. And it's a, it's a lot of elevation in a short space of time. Um, and actually, I felt fine up until about 22K. You turn this corner and you see the mountain. <laughs> and I'd always pride myself on being mentally tough. Like, you know, I'd get through a lot and actually dig a lot deeper than I think I, my body should be able to go sometimes. It broke me, mm. absolutely broke me. Like, um, and I thought it was physical. I thought I was falling apart. But actually looking back on it now, it was completely mental. It was all in my head. And I panicked, I got myself in this tears. I was sort of like, I was welling up. I, mm. Cassie was running towards me down the road. I was panicking, short of breath. Got myself through that. You joined me on the um, on the zombie hill, and that was just really tough because um, we're just going so slow. Yeah. Um, but everyone was. But it was really <laughs> hard to go from running four minute thirty, five minute um, per kilometer to suddenly like ten minute per kilometer <laughs> yeah. walk jogging. Um, yeah, it, it, that was really tough, and that was in my head more than anything. And I think that just comes down to experience because I was the same when I was doing my one. You think. I'm going so slow, there's just surely no way everyone else is doing this, but most people are actually, aside from the very lucky few at the very front who are racing it and they were going quick. 
our experiences in both races, I think, are fairly much for muchness. And I think what actually really got to me is like, I'm used to normal, you know, normal events. So a half marathon, okay, I know what that should probably take me, even on a slow yeah. day. So in my head, I'm eight or so hours into this race. And I'm going, okay, well, I've only got another half marathon to go, so that's going to take me X amount of time. <laughs> no way. It's going to take you twice that time up this mountain. And, and it's suddenly that realization looking at the mountain, this is going to take me a flipping long time. Yeah, and I think we both had the same um, issues during the race that these superb watches that we have that tell us our splits per every kilometre. Oh my word, that got a little bit frustrating. I think my slowest kilometre in my race was a 35 minute kilometre. I do love this polar watch, but I was ready to throw <laughs> it out. <laughs> um, yeah, but Fraser. Getting to the finish line, what a feeling here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, the finish line in Kelpman is, um, you know, you, you drop back down off the mountain and you finish just running, just running along tarmac, which thankfully was a good way to finish because I found some sort of way to get into a sort of rhythm and it just was a relief to see that finish barrier, for, for, or bat banner rather, for, for you, we were just going, as you say, up and up and up and it never stopped, the finish finally came at the very top and it, it was a really emotional experience wasn't it? It was, for, I'm sure it was for you but Norseman is, as I've said in our, our video, is mm. um, it meant a lot to me yeah. and actually having you and Cassie there, whew, yeah, <laughs> that, that got me you know, <laughs> yeah. a bit wild. Not so, again, surely. No, 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 <laughs> um, I've got it all out of my system now but it, it, it meant a heck of a lot um, and you know, as I, I touched on in the video, um, Cassie and myself made a lot of sacrifices mm. and it meant a lot having her there as well. So that was a really special thing about these races. Actually, the people that ordinarily would make, might be just on the sidelines and mm. have sacrificed a lot with you were involved in the race. And that was a really nice thing about these, oh, these events. 100% Mark, it was, it was a superb part of this race. And I think b both of our races, the finish um, sort of scenarios encapsulated that. We just were able to a shared it with those who had been helping us throughout the day and just made us feel like a team. And I mean, you had your dad there, someone who's yeah. probably you know sacrificed a lot when you were kids, um, ferrying you around to training. No, I, I mean, it was great. I mean, and, and, and you know, I had mum tracking from a home and mm. other family members, and the same with you. That's what's really super about these races. Everybody, you know, if they are able to be there, that's amazing. But if they weren't, there's still this feeling that we were all doing this together, wasn't it? Yeah. And everyone who's helped us in both our sort of long careers of racing, this was this sort of really nice way of. I don't know, it was kind of like, certainly for me, it felt like tying things together. Um, because, I, you know, for me, luckily, I was doing a race that was in Scotland, and I've talked about how proud I am to be Scottish and all of that stuff. But for you, there was clearly a huge um, motivating factor because you've talked about how you had spotted Norseman in a magazine when you were basically just coming into the sport. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, in short, what an experience and um, it, what a community as well mm. in these X Try events. A uh, fantastic atmosphere at the finish line and the dinners after and whatnot. A um, couple of tips for our viewers out there, anything you picked up on? Oh goodness, I mean, get yourself in a ballot for one of these races for a start because they are definitely becoming sought after events. They really are. I mean, all of these X Try races are getting many, many, many more applicants for their ballot system than um, there are spaces in the race, unfortunately. If you can, if you're lucky enough to be able to get to the event, wreck it. I know that's not something that a lot of people are able to do because the race could be really far away. I mean, there's people literally from all over the globe that were um, in Scotland when um, I finished. It was a really good chats with people from all corners. Yeah. And, and you did the same. Well, we were incredibly fortunate to get a start, so we're very thankful to mm. everyone out there that helped us to get that. Um, my bits of advice actually would be everything that you think you know about triathlon, throw that out the window. <laughs> yeah. Start fresh, this is completely new, <laughs> completely different. One bit of really good advice I got given by someone who'd done Norseman before is, forget about doing your paced runs and your power on the bike, just go hilly. Go for long walks as well, like mm. go off into the hills and do long days out walking, and that could be with your family and your yeah. partner, your significant other. Just just go and get some time on the legs. So that kind of arduous miles where you're just like fatigue and wearing down, having to go over boulders. Cause these are like, these are strong, strong man events almost. Like they, they and, whittle you down. Yeah, and that type of um, activity as such is, is, is generally largely difficult, different to anything we had done. So it, it tired us even more. And on that note of it being totally different, my other good bit of advice that I was given, and I totally forgot this until now was, Put your head up and have a look around at the stunning scenery because in both races we were so fortunate to be in incredible um, parts of the world um, and just don't think about it as a race, throw that instinct out the window and just 
pop your head up, slow down, and take it all in. And I really tried to do that, and I know you did too. Mm, definitely. Um, actually, that was <laughs> kept me distracted from the race in itself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Um, if you guys have enjoyed today's video, please do hit the thumbs up button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, do click on the globe and subscribe to GTN. If you'd like to see Fraser's attempt at Keltner, a very good attempt at that, you can see that by clicking just down here. And if you want to see Mark's Norseman experience, that one is here.